It is time for an elimination match in the lower bracket. At this point, it's one best of three and you're out. And if you win, you continue on the run of doom down in lowers to try to make it to the finals on Sunday. For this first elimination match, coming to the stage from her local hometown here in Boston, let's welcome Amy the Amazonian. Amy will be running Slesnia Tokens and Mono White. One of the two players here running Slesnia Tokens. The other will be her opponent, one of the players who qualified as top eight on MTG Arena. From Italy, let's welcome Quicksort. Quicksort also running Slesnia Token, but instead of Mono White, running Mono Red going to be two aggressive matchups back to back in a field that's been favoring control. Who will win? Let's find out right now. Good luck to both of you and over to Marshall and David. Thank you, Day 9 And uh, as you can see, our players are just about getting ready to battle here. And David, you know, we mentioned it and, and Day 9 just said it too, but this is an elimination match. Having lost their opening round, there is no wiggle room for either of our players here in our main feature. And that means that a loss here will send them home that would be the end of the road. Yes, yeah, it's not something uh, Quicksort has experienced. He went 3-0 yesterday and never had his back against the wall. Let's take a look at the deck list here. Amazonian has brought Celestia tokens. Not a particularly popular uh, option here for the players, but in this match, it's gonna show up a lot. Amazonian, I, what, what do you make of the list here? Uh, you know, something like you said, we haven't seen a lot. Actually, one of the other players running it is her opponent, Quicksort. Uh, their list are fairly close. Uh, she shaved a few cards down to three of, such as March of the Multitudes, Conclave Tribunal, and she's got some spicy one ofs. Uh, an Immortal Sun and a Shalai both function as pumping up the creatures, but have extra abilities against other decks. So they're very versatile cards, and she opted to have some of those in the main. Also, Knight of Autumn is something to, uh, to notice. It's different than a traditional list, but gives her a little play against a lot of the enchantments out there. Yeah, other side uh, for, for Amazonian, similar, but a little bit more uh, streamlined here, the old mono white aggro. Yeah, this is uh, the standard kind of mono white deck we've seen throughout the weekend. She's running four copies of Unbreakable Formation. It's one of the most uh, important cards in the deck, and she wants to ensure that she has it. Another card we see that we haven't seen much is Leonine Vanguard. Not a lot of players have been running that. Um, it, it, it functions the same. I mean, you just want to run uh, enough one drops to have a consistently curve out and play one on turn one, two on turn two. So which one drops you choose doesn't matter too much. Yeah, she's got a lot of them there. And as we mentioned just a minute ago, Quicksort also has Lesnia tokens here. So two of the players in the field playing the deck. Yeah, and like I say, this one's very streamlined. The one ofs are not here. Everything's pretty much four of. Uh, two ofs on Unbreakable, form Unbreakable Formation and Amara and Tristani, but those are the same as an Amazonian's list. Fairly standard version of the list. And on the other side, uh, Quicksort opting also for the uh, Celestia Aggro plus aggressive deck, though he's gone for mono red here. Yeah, and this one's a lot different than the ones we saw yesterday. He's only running 17 land and no experimental frenzy. You can kind of cheat on those lands when you don't need them to cast a, a bunch of spells in one turn. Uh, it's more focused on just getting that quick damage in and burning you out. Yeah, risk factor could be big down the stretch here. Not a lot of uh, Mythic Championship experience here for our players. Zero played before. Uh, for, for either of them, though some serious grinding here on Arena, about 5,000 games played for either, for both of them. Yeah, not much Mythic Championship experience, like you said, but they've got pretty two of the highest totals I think I've seen in Arena games. That's right. All right, let's take a look at opening hands for our players. Ooh, this is going to get intense here. It looks like we've got Amazonian on the top part of our screen and her opener with Mono White. Well, it looks pretty good here. Yeah, Mono White on the bunch plate. Bunch of one drops. Four and a, one drops, yeah. yeah. And then down here for Quicksort. Well, it's the we're going to get mirrors uh, after this. It's going to be uh, oh, Celestia no. Aggro against Celestia Aggro, but that means that we get the Aggro mirror here. Mono Red versus Mono White, though. Yeah, and this looks like a keeper as well. It's a keeper. It's it's not that powerful of a hand. I mean, no. he has a couple of removal spells to answer some initial creatures. Hopefully, he can uh, fuel back up and light up the stage, but he doesn't have many bodies to kind of get on the board in battle. Really wants to see a Goblin Chain Whirler. Early. Also doesn't want to draw another land for the rest of the game. Three, and we are underway. Let's get rolling here. Goblin Chain Whirler would, would do work on this hand, as we see. Yeah, the old 5-1 drop opener. And uh, let's see, only the Snubhorn Sentry survives it? The Bodyguard could potentially protect something. Mm -hmm. um, Normally, you would see a player play that one first because it has more power, but the Vanguard likely will have two power uh, if she plays 
two creatures next turn and they both live. And she'll get that extra life bump as well. That can be very important against Red as it turns out. And turns out Quicksort knows that, so he's going to say, let's just shock that thing and get it off the battlefield immediately. I'm a little shocked. Uh, he didn't use the Fanatical Firebrand. It's, uh, it's a little more efficient than one damage for one. Save that two in case something ends up with two toughness later. You, you're not a fan of that play? I didn't say I wasn't a fan. I'm just a little shocked. See what I did there? You see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, man, <laughs> we fanatic, got there. fanatic, we got it took there. me a bit, to it, took me a bit. it took me a bit, it took me a bit. All right, here's Fanatical Firebrand now for Quicksort. And you know what? Double trouble, he's got two of them on the battlefield. Will he use one right away, or will he wait? He will wait. Sometimes this can be a little bit of a risky proposition as you can allow your opponent to uh, cast a card like Venerated Loxodon. Right, land Loxodon, he wouldn't be able to respond to the land drop. Now he could respond to the Loxodon trigger, putting a counter on that. Uh, vampire, but yeah, this works as well. Yeah, that's there's no reason to do that. You could just pass, let damage happen in combat. If anything happens, respond. Hunted Witness is the follow up play. And what does Amazonian have? A second Legion's Landing. Being a legendary enchantment, she'll only be able to keep one of them, but that token's still going to come into play. So now she's got three creatures lined up for next turn. Yeah, that's and, why Legion's uh, Landing is such a great card. Because yeah. for one mana, you, you don't even have to have the enchantment flip. You just get a 1-1 one, one lifelinker, which is all this deck really wants. Now he's going to want to remove one of these creatures and keep her off three so that she won't flip Legion's Landing. But like I said, this hand, it was a little reactive, kind of slow, and, and it's not really getting any ground. He's going to need to really make up. Quicksort's really in the tank here. This seems to be a bit of an inflection point for this opening game. We see unbreakable formation in hand for Amazonian as well. And uh, he's certainly going to have to consider that. If she's going to draw a third land, she could start responding to things. And he may need to be a little more pro proactive, do some things on his main face here. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to kill the 1-1 one, one Vampire before you pass the turn, or before, at least before she enters combat, because you don't want Legion's Landing flipping. I think he's considering he could Sacrifice the Firebrand, deal damage to her to cast Light Up a Stage for one. Um, looks like he's going to just go ahead and Lightning Strike. Snubhorn out of the way. Instead. Yeah, he, he actually said an upkeep stop there and said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Lightning Strike this thing on your upkeep. He has let the, uh, the token survive, but we'll see a block and then a sacrifice to kill the token. And this is an efficient play here from Quicksort. Yeah, you can use that one creature to prevent two damage, which is in this spot, that's very well executed. Yeah, but the... Endless string of one drops from Amazonian doesn't stop. She has a deck that is jam packed with them. And now, once again, Quicksort has to decide what do I want to use my burn spells on? Allowing that, uh, that Legion's Landing to flip just not really an option here. Yeah, and he's really bottlenecked with uh, expensive cards. You know, risk factor, light up the stage without spectacle. They both cost three. He's got a two drop in hand, so we can only cast one spell this turn. And he also has to prioritize removing a creature, so he's kind of in a jam right here. So he's going to take down Dauntless Bodyguard. She's going to sacrifice it in response, but the point is, it's gone. Snubhorn Sentry was a draw step. Another one drop here from Amazonian, and she is really giving uh, Quicksort all he can handle here, keeping three creatures on the battlefield every single turn that she passes back, and uh, he's got to keep scrambling to yeah. keep her down to just two. He was really hoping for some breathing room, hoping maybe she would have a turn where she would pass with two creatures so that he can cast one of these expensive spells in his hand, try to get some card advantage to get something going, but... Unfortunately, every time she plays a creature, it, it really plays his hand and what he's going to do. But look at this. She takes the two damage, maybe playing around shock there, and that means that light up the stage is online, and he found Fanatical Firebrand off of it. He can use that to take down Sky Marcher Aspirant and once again delay this flip. Yeah, it's a really tough spot for her to block there because if she blocks, the Snubhorn Sentry takes two, has one toughness remaining, and then something oh, like a Goblin Chain Whirler oh, would just God. scoop up everything off the board and leave her with a token. Yeah, so no way she can block. No way she can block there. But it's going to work out well for Quicksort as uh, Spectacle really coming in handy there, allowing him to cast Light Up the Stage and what ended up being a removal spell with Fanatical Firebrand. So she just says, all right, plan B then. Yeah, unbreakable. unbreakable formation on just the two creatures. Let's burn a hole in her pocket. Indeed, she decided to spend it here. No, but she got value out of the tokens because like right now, ideally, she might use it. Nah, probably not because the Witness would leave something behind. But wanted to get that damage in, get the pressure started because it was just kind of rotting away 
not doing much. And the creature we're going to be trading one for one. Now Snubhorn's out of uh, lightning strike range. Kind of interesting here from Quicksort. You know, he's playing the super stripped down version. Only 18 lands in this tech yet. He's drawn a lot of his three mana spells already. Chain Whirler and Risk Factor in hand. And while normally that could be uh, a bit of a, a problem for him, it looks like now that he's survived to this mid to late stage of the game, he's going to get to start just unloading his uh, the big guns here. Yeah, he, he's, he's stabilized. Uh, and things like Risk Factor, light up the stage, allow him to pull ahead in a, in a stalemate situation, which we've kind of got here but her not being able to flip that legion's landing he, uh, you know it really worked out well for him that she she drew a few lands cheeky little attack here from quicksword he's going to send in with the g2 lava runner oh she's actually going to go for the double block so he will get a little bit of value here cashing in the lava runner for the uh the hunted witness well i think she gets the value here sure yeah, but but did. i mean she could have just blocked with the one four and it just nothing would have happened right <laughs> because of this. Goblin Chain Whirler is going to come down and clean up the mess. So Quicksort escapes with a one-for-one one against a Hunted Witness. Land off the top, and there's a Venerated Loxodon. And we've seen numerous Amazonian. times this weekend that card really changes the swing, of, uh, changes the flow of the game. It really does. There's a Shock off the top of the library, which will clear the way for an attack here. As it looks like Quicksort is willing to trade off his Viachino Pyromancer for the Venerated Loxodon and the Shock, and it uh, looks like Amazonian's going to take take up the offer here. Yeah, he's not worried about the card disadvantage of trading two cards for one because he's got Risk Factor, and his opponent at 12. Wow, another Loxodon off the top, David. It's a lot of power on the, on the last few turns. Good draw step there from Amazonian. Yeah, he's going to need to find a burn spell so that he can get his Chain Whirler through. Unfortunately, I think the Risk Factor probably takes four and goes to eight here, knowing he only has one card left. Yep. It's tough with Jumpstart, though, because you're going to have to do it right, right one more time. That's right. Also interesting, you know, one of the big differences between the list that Quicksort has brought is that he's issued that, that ultimate high end that we've seen from these Red Deck Experimental Frenzy. So he doesn't have that option here. He can't draw that and start going off. He needs to do it the hard way. Yeah, and she calls his, his block immediately. He attacks. Yep. She could potentially get blown out if he had a burn spell for first strike damage, but... Uh, She's not, you know, she doesn't have the, the luxury to, to kind of make those decisions with the life total being what it was, so. Oh, so she snapped it off and it worked and it, she, Goblin Chain Whirler hits the graveyard there. And now she's going back on the offensive with this Venerated Loxodon, though her draw step for the turn, no bueno. It was just a planes off the top of the library. Here's Risk Factor now. And now there's a real decision here. Yeah, it's a really tough spot. I, I mean, mean, she takes the four, she's dead to a shock, although she lets him have the cards, and it looks like it worked out well for her. Three Quick lands. sort finds a grand total of a Gitu Lava Runner off of his draw step plus the draw three. He bricked hard. Wow. He's got a pair of Lava Runners and nothing else going on here. I guess he could double block. Ooh, cancel that order. Banalish Marshall off the top of the library now for Amazonian. A big draw step for her. Now, she doesn't know that he has two lands in hand. I mean, it's likely because he didn't play anything, but it could be burn spells. So she's yep. got to make sure she preserves her life total, holds back blockers. Yeah, smart attack there from Amazonian. Just attacking with the Loxodon. That's a one-turn clock now. Another mountain off the top of the library for Quicksort, and he somehow is flooding out. Yeah, and he's only playing 17 lands, so to draw oh eight. Oh my goodness and Actually, he's nine, because there's one in the graveyard from the jump start. He's drawn over half his lands. Amazonian looking good here. Snubhorn Sentry is going to hit the battlefield, but wow. Yeah, 4-4. Four, 10th four. permanent gives her another lethal attacker in the form of Snubhorn Sentry now that she has the city's blessing. Then attacking with all three, flips Adanto. She's got to block both large creatures so the marshal can come. And that is going to do it. Quicksort's going to scoop him up. He looks and says, you're at six. There's no one card that I can draw to, to get you dead, even if I go for the double chump block. And that is Amazonian winning game number one, which is going to set up our game number two, which Buckle is going up. to be Celestia <laughs> Aggro versus Celestia Aggro. And this is a mirror match. Sure, sometimes you get the, the right sequence of cards where you can run over your opponent, but sometimes it stalls out a bit and the board state gets absurd. Yeah, I mean, we likely to see a really crazy game with a lot of permanents here. Um, the things I notice is her one-offs actually seem like they could be pretty important. The Immortal Sun just gives her the ability to, to overpower him, drawing so many more cards a turn, and also giving her creatures that little bump. And Shalai actually allows her to just keep pumping her creatures every turn, so we could see both those things really come into play. He does have a fourth March of the Multitude, so if it does get to that, he's going to likely be able to make more tokens, but 
This should be a really fun match. All right, let's take a look at our opening hands here. This is for Quick Sort, and this one looks nice. Double Saperlene migration with venerated Loxodon and three lands, plus a history of Benalia on the top. Oh, well, looks pretty good too. So we've got a couple of good openers here. Allegiance landing once again for Amazonian. Play one way, right? Ooh, and there's an uh, Allegiance landing off the top as well. But it looks like Saperlene migration is the more efficient play here for Quick Sort. Yeah, and I think we're going to see it. It's interesting to see how they use their flower flourishes. If they use it for flower or if they wait for flourish for that one big turn to force your opponent to have some bad blocks. Yeah, that is generally the way that this matchup goes is that the players are both kind of free to build out their board. They're not necessarily incentivized to attack early. And then it's the one that finds the way to go big for that one turn. Kind yeah. of go over the top. Quicksword actually has four flower flourishes. So. Wow. I guess Amazonian he can, only has two. I guess he can afford it. All right, so are we going to see Venerated Loxodon here? Looks like it. Nope. I think we might. No. It's tough. Like, you really want a fourth land. Yeah, I was going to say you're going to see Sapling Migration, Legion's Landing, and then Loxodon on all five creatures. Yeah, there you go. How do you like that? My goodness sakes. What a turn here for Quicksort. Going from two 1-1s. One to a 4-4 four, four, and 5-2-2s five, and two, two. Five, two, two in one turn. And by the way, David, that's off of three lands. That is incredible. Yeah, and he's going to have Legion's Landing flipping to give him his fourth. So this is one of the starts that we talked about as being a possibility that really quick kind of run you over style start and Quicksort has it. Yeah, I mean, she's in trouble, right? With Knight the of Night. Autumn to blow up the uh, Legion's Landing here. Okay. Yeah, and it's going to trade her the token. I mean, you kind of want to make it a 4-3 so it can brawl, get in there and battle, but you Seriously. can't have that Legion's Landing flip either. So it's kind of a bad a bad spot. I mean, this is a really uh, amazing draw from Quick Start. Serious, yeah, Quick Start indeed. <laughs> Quick Start's going to attack with everything. You're not wrong, David. And look at this. She's already down to eight, and she's got a smile on her face like, yep, I've been on the right side of this draw before, and I know how this ends. And it is not good for me. And she even just went, whoa, with the history of Benalia hitting the battlefield. I'm, I'm, I'm she's eating. got her own, but she's way behind. I said buckle up, and I'm over here eating crow. I mean, <laughs> this match. Hey, it's, these draws happen occasionally, but you were right. Generally speaking, these things end up going long. And look at that flourish off the top of the library. Just a few more cards, a few more lands, I should say. And this one will be over, but you know what? Might be done anyway. Yeah, I don't see how she can get out of this. She doesn't have any sweeper effects, and her creatures just aren't nearly the size. She's uh, having a chump block. So which side would you rather be on here, David? Amazonian or Quicksort? Just give me the expert opinion on this one. Expert opinion, I'm going mm. to have to go with Quicksort side gonna, here. You're going to fall on the side of Quicksort. So yeah, he's got four, five, six, seven creatures on the battlefield. He's going to be facing down just a couple of creature sapling migration plus a 2-2 two, two knight. All he has to do is say, send in the team. And this one's going to be in the books. Quick sort with the quick win here in game number two. And this is going to prompt a really interesting game three setup for us here, David, because this is where the players get to choose if you're just joining us for coverage here of the Mythic Invitational, powered by Omen Bay HP. I'm Marshall Cyclic with David Williams. Thanks so much for coming along. Rules are a little different here. The players each brought two decks. They were decided at random for games one, and then they flipped the decks for game two. But here they actually get to choose. Yeah, and I think you're going to see this what we just saw, because Quick sort mono red aggro deck. When you're mono red, you don't want to play against Celeste in the aggro. You know, that's just not where you want to be. It, it can work out. Yeah, Chain Waller can get some tokens, but in general, those tokens are going to have two toughness. And as we saw in the mono white match, even though mono red is traditionally favored against mono white, I just don't see him risking ending up against Celeste in the aggro. So I think he's going to go with Celeste in the aggro. And then I think on the flip side, Amy knows that, and she's not going to want to end up with the mono white aggro deck against Celeste in the aggro. So I think we could see the same matchup we just saw. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. They just both fear being on the wrong side of that aggro versus a deck that can go wider, faster, has a bunch of lifelink. Like, it's just a nightmare. Yeah, the real, I mean, the real downside to playing Celeste in the aggro is when you play against Esper Controller decks that have sweepers or Find Finality, things like that. So when you're not worried about that, it's a really good deck against these aggro decks. Another thing that we're used to in Magic is that if you've lost the game, you get to choose whether you're going to be on the play or the draw for the following game. In this tournament for game three, they re-roll. Like, Quicksort could say, you know what, that worked great. I'm going to go back to my Celestia aggro deck and could be on the play as well. I mean, yeah. it's it's th this, this is a very swingy game three. And I'm going to remind you that these players are facing elimination. The loser of this game is out of the tournament. Okay, it looks like, oh wow, Amazonian. So Amazonian's gone the, the way that you, you thought that she would. She's got her 
Uh, Celestia Agro deck, and that looks like a fine choice, and it looks like the same thing for Quicksort. So. Yeah, it's just too risky to end up against yeah. one of these decks with an aggro small creature deck. So who's on the play, though? Quicksort. Quicksort did, in fact, win after winning game two, so he gets to be on the play here. And now, let's see if he can take advantage. Now, this draw is a little less robust than before. It doesn't have the sapling migration to sort of power out a lot of creatures quickly. Yeah, that would be the ideal draw step here, but instead it's going to be a plains. Remember, March of the Multitudes is the type of card that can get completely out of hand. Although I will say that Amara Soul of the Accord can be quite annoying here, and uh, Amazonian's going to need a blocker. And she's found it, Tide Taker. Pretty good blocker, too, because yeah. uh, Tide Taker trades, and you both end up with a token. So it, it's I, not really a. Things looking good for Quicksort here early, though. Look at this curve out that he's able to set up. He's got the Amara, and oh, wow, look at this. He's going to be aggressive here. Just take down the Tide Taker and generate a token right away using Conclave Tribunal and Convoke. Yeah, it allows him to also get more creatures on the board. Now he's up two to zero, and it, it's hard for her to play multiple creatures without a card like Sapling Migration. Oh, wow, no third land from Amazonia. Uh -oh. That's going to uh -oh. hurt. Oh, she draws a six-mana spell, the Immortal Sun, and this one could be falling apart for fan favorite Amazonian. We have two challengers facing off. Only one is going to advance past this round, though. Yeah, it's it, it's unfortunate because she, it seems like she could get in it. You know, with one land, she could cast Night of Autumn, destroy the Conclave Tribunal, have two creatures on the board again, but... She's yeah. going to need to find it immediately. Yeah, and, and Quicksort's got a pretty amazing curve out. Next turn is going to be Tristani to pump the team and generate two more tokens. And then he's got March of the Multitudes waiting to make even more. Yeah, so the, the fact is, is that Amazonian's playing catch-up at this point. That's it. She, she did find the land. That was a huge draw step for her. But she's got to use this whole turn just to cast a 2-1 to get rid of the, uh, <coughs> the Tribunal. Or excuse me, the uh, she actually went for the history of Benalia yeah. there. Yeah, it stops the generate stops one more token coming on the board, which is kind of the same as getting rid of the tribunal. But that future turn of the chapter three and having one less creature on the board is better because of things like Tristani pumping them up. And look at this huge turn now for Quicksword. He is surely in the lead at this point. He fires off Tristani discordant, pumping up his entire team. Two, four, six, eight, eleven power now besides Tristani. And he crunches in there with four of it. He's up to 25. Amazonians down to 12. And she is well and truly up against it here as Quicksort moves ever closer to advancing past this round. Now, he's still got a lot of work to do, even if he gets by Amazonian here. But still, this is stage one. Yeah, it's just she really needs a, an effect to pump her creatures because they're just not going to match up well against these two twos and three threes. Yeah, and we're at the point now where look at this, bang, 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 five creatures hit the red zone, and that's Adanto, the first fort appearing on the battlefield. Thanks to at least three creatures attacking this turn. And what do we got, a trade in a chump lock? Down to six for Amazonian. This looks like it might be it for her. Yeah, it feels bad, man. Yeah, this is just brutal, and uh, even Quicksort can fire off March of the Multitudes on end step here to really seal the deal. Yeah, and you know what it means when your opponent plays that Temple Garden to play untapped with all that mana. She's going to go for Unbreakable Formation to go out fighting. This does transform Legion's landing, but it is too little, too late here for Amazonian. Yeah, and she's able to go ahead and play Amara post-combat, but it's, it's going to be too little. Bang, bang, bang. But again, look at the life total. This thing just snowballs out of control, this uh, Celestia deck. And here we go, March of the Multitudes. For five. Oh, my goodness, which is going to add another 10 power to the battlefield. It's all spread out. She knows. And there's just nothing that Amazonian can do at this point. It looks like the run is going to end here. Quick sort. Adding another 10 power. That's right, nine tokens on the battlefield just in the middle there. And a few friends joining. Everything's going to hit the red zone. This is a lethal attack. Blocking bang, bang, bang. Formality. 14 take 15 damage. And a big smile for Mythic Amazonian. But it is Quicksort who defeats her and moves on to stay alive in our final 16 players here. Well played by both. But again, Quicksort is your winner. Yeah, I mean, Amazonian's got to be a little disappointed in her draws. They were both pretty unfortunate in those, those mirror matches. 
always hurts to go down that way and feel like you didn't really get a chance to, it does. to get and, in there and play. You know, we've been talking about the play draw here. Super important in this match. I mean, let's not forget, Quicksort ended up with the play. Yeah, although the way that the hands worked out and her not having the, the mana, I don't think even if she was on the play, much would have changed about that game. I think her issues are more that. Well, he slammed the door thanks to, to his draw and being on the play, and that was Quicksort moving through. Now, again, that does not put Quicksort into the into the top four just yet. Got to win three more. He's got to win a lot more. So that was stage one for him. But great job, Amazonian, and a great run by you making it into Absolutely. the top 16. So really good stuff there from the feature match area. We've, of course, got a lot more uh, action to bring you today. Um, our backup match, which I don't even know if they're still going. No, it looks like they're done. Uh, that was uh, Seth Manfield and Matt Nass. We'll get updates for you on that. But right now, we've got Becca Scott with Quick Swords. Thank you, Becca. Yeah, he. We, we talked about that here in the booth as well. There was really not a great choice in that last round. You just had to go Celestia and Tokens had to for play both of them. Yeah, you just couldn't put yourself in that position, right? All right, that means that we're going to get a chance to look at our other feature match, which, by the way, is still playing here. That is Seth Manfield versus Matt Nass. So we just saw two challengers face off. Now we come over here, and we've got some MPLers going oh, at it. Oh, look at this. They are still in game one. And you oh, know no. why? David, no. Esper Control Mirror. 4, 8, 12, 15, 18, 20 lands on the battlefield for Seth. Yeah. All right, well, let's settle in here, everybody. <laughs> and this is uh, maybe if you're thirsty, a good time to go grab a glass of water because we're going to be here for a little while. This well, is kind of how these not. matches go. Looks like Seth has a Teferi emblem. Teferi emblem is hard to beat. I actually don't really know how you beat it. Yeah, no, you, that's you, a good point, David. You um, won't be able to get your own Teferi emblem because your Teferis won't last. And Not in know. love with Matt Nass's hand here either. None of the... Oh, excuse Bunch me, guys. Bricks. It's actually game three. The, the game counts were wrong. Okay. They both, their other decks were mono red aggro, so it looks like they both settled in on this. So uh, Matt Nass, I guess his hope is to somehow get his life total above 30 and maybe time runs out and he wins in the extra turns, but... That's going to be difficult. It's going to require a Mastermind's acquisition to go get Sanguine Sacrament if he has it. Let's check his sideboard here. He does. Yeah, talk to us about how that works. The, the round timer actually has been extended 60 minutes here today. Um, oh, it's 60. It was 45 before, 60 now. What, what, how does it work if the, if the time, if it does go to time? Time does run out. The players play five additional turns, and then whoever is higher life total is declared the winner. If it's tied at that point as far as life total first goes, first life, life total change in in a, in a direction that is beneficial to you will we'll, we'll earn you the victory. But it looks like we've still got 36 minutes yeah, left in the round. Yeah, that's not, so. not an issue here. And this is game three. The Fairy Emblem can make quick work of these lands. And things looking really, really good for Seth Manfield, right? I, mean, I know it's hard to envision this stuff if you're just joining in because there's nothing going on on the battlefield. But if you look at Matt Nass's hand, those are all blanks. Those well, cards do nothing. Raska's Contempt can take care of the Kaya. Sure. Um, not, actually, the, not the emblem. I actually wonder, though, I mean, he, who's ahead on cards, right? Because let's just say you've asked his contempt, although he does have a negate and it resolves, you get rid of the Kaya. Maybe Seth doesn't have any more win conditions. I, we don't know the graveyard yet. Maybe Seth, even though he removes all of Matt Nass's permanents, he runs out of cards first. So I don't know if maybe you want to wait until you exile all his lands, but that is, let's see how many we got, four, eight. 10, 20. Maybe there's not even enough turns to exile all his lands to make sure that he can't remove any of your win conditions. So I guess we understand why Matt Nass isn't conceding. Both these players, though, have a lot of cards that don't have too much function at this stage in the game. Cry of the Carnarium doesn't do much. Chaos Wrath not going to do much. I'm looking at their decks for win conditions. See if anybody has a Nezahal like Gabriel Nassif did. In the, in the main? Yeah, I don't see anything like that either. They both just I mean, you've been talking about it all weekend, David. You said, you know, one of the keys to the matchup is to not draw your dead cards. Look yeah. at Madness's hand. Yeah, and there's, there's not much he can do. I mean... He's got six dead cards. His lands are going away one at a time. And there's a Chemist's Insight now for Manfield. He's going to have to count the cards in his library, I believe. Yeah, he's no, going to cast nine it, Nine cards. He's only got nine cards in his library. He's going to have to find a Teferi, So he needs it, to find and resolve a Teferi, and, and there it, it is right there. He's just got to make sure he can protect it with all those lands. Matt Nass theoretically could get into a fight over removing it. Yeah, and what, what you're looking at here is Seth Manfield working on the blue mana sources, it looks like, from, uh, from Matt Nass, just taking those down one by one to make sure that he can win that fight with Teferi when the time comes. And Seth does know five out of six cards in Matt Nass's hand. 
He can see five blanks. The only one he doesn't know doesn't have the little eye on it. Another Kai is Wrath. Just another blank. Counting how many so, of with the negate, he can just run out the Teferi here. And that's exactly what he does. Teferi resolves because Matt Nass can't do anything about it. This is an elimination match, by the way. The loser is going to be out of the tournament. They're going to have to settle with a solid top 16 finish here. And there's Teferi plus to remove yet another blue mana source. So there's plenty left there for Nass. Yeah, seven more. Search for Escanta here for, uh, for Seth. But Seth have the, has this nearly locked up? Yeah, I mean, unless he miscalculates or misclicks or something of that sort, I don't see how he could lose this game. Six cards in his deck. He just wants to make sure he doesn't accidentally draw with not enough cards left, maybe cast an insight with one card left in his deck, something like that. And there's Chemistry's insight. Another Teferi here of Dominaria. Teferi serving an interesting purpose here in the late stages of this game, that will actually allow Seth Manfield to not lose to decking. If your library is empty and you're to draw a card, you will lose the game. But Teferi has kind of a hidden mode where you can do the minus three ability on, on itself. itself. Imagine if that said weird. other permanent. How this different magic be would have been much the past different year. Card. Yeah, the, this standard format would have been a bit different as it's allowed the control players to use Teferi as, in many cases, their only win condition, or at least their primary win condition. It's pretty wild how one little word, the word other, changes the whole format totally. for it's years. Crazy. And looking at graveyards, seeing yeah. what's left. They have deck lists, so once they see a graveyard this large, they can deduce what's left in their opponent's deck and what's likely in their hand. Yeah, process of elimination here to get as much information as possible for these players. And again, you see this march onward from uh, Seth Manfield targeting those blue lands. There's only three left now. Ten lands total on the battlefield for Matt Nass, dwarfed by the number of Seth Manfield, who has over double that. Okay, Chemister's Insight. Is there any answers he can find? He finds his own copy of Teferi. Unfortunately for him, all Seth has to do is draw a card to remove this Teferi. That's right. Isolated Chapel is the big tank situation here for Nass. This match could use a little Nexus of Fate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. Have, that, have, that does end it. <laughs> have uh, seven lands in your hand and one Nexus of Fate. Just keep discard, discarding it. Oh. I'll be decking me. <clears throat> okay, he's going to run out to Fairy Hero of Dominaria, but Seth Manfield doesn't even bother playing the negate on it. He says, I don't think that that's the way that this is going to end. Yeah, it actually doesn't really do anything in this spot, especially because he can just draw a card and exile it. So it's five mana, draw a card for Matt Nass. Right. No reason to counter that. Only a couple of cards left in the, in the library, though, for Seth Manfield. Of course, if he were to use Teferi on the other Teferi, that would just bolster that to three. As long as Seth has access to a Teferi, he's fine. Will not be able to get decked here. Finally can put one of these Mortifies to use. Mm -hmm. That's one of the few sideboard cards that, act, or excuse me, uh, kind of dead cards, as we say, that actually has a target at all. He's also got Vraska's Contempt that he's going to fire off now on the Teferi again, just using the cards in his hand. But we are very much going through the motions here in Manfield versus Nass. Seth Manfield in control of this Esper mirror, and he's just going to start firing off more and more. Exiles here from this, uh, from this emblem, and he has whittled down Matt Nass's mana base from upwards of 20. One card left, left in his library. Yeah, just one left now from Manfield. He's flying pretty close to the sun, but He's got that insurance policy thanks to Teferi, and you'll see it right here. Teferi minus target itself. Now it's going to become, in this case, the bottom card of his library. And then he's going to run out another Teferi. And he can just loop here. He doesn't even need multiples, but sure, it works too. 
Yeah, if he wants, he can yeah, draw a card here and exile another land. It's the last card in his library that he doesn't know about in his Drowned Catacomb. You can see his library now is just one face-up to Fairy, <laughs> showing both players that they know that what card that is already. He's got three of them. He can actually, with enough mana, just get them all looping. And he does have plenty of mana as well. Here's Chemistry's Insight off the top for Matt Nass, but it's too little too late for him. Is there anything he could possibly find? He's digging and digging. He's hanging in there. Yeah, I don't I don't. You'd have to kill happening. all of the Teferis. Something I noticed that's cool is the, the Gruul sleeves that Matt Nass, I mean, the Rakdos sleeves Matt Nass using, the little Rakdos emblem lights up. Ooh. I saw it light up when he, when he drew a card. That's pretty sweet. There he goes again. A little card style. Yeah. See that, right? The sleeves? The player that. sleeves are an interesting touch. I like that. Yeah, I like that too. I'm going to get me some of those. And here we go to Fairy once again, targeting himself, becoming the only card left in library now for I Manfield. Might just put this one on underneath two, just to have two. Sure. Got a third one in his hand. Just keep doing this all day. And as far as he's concerned, that's exactly what he's going to yeah. do. Why now not? His library is two copies of Fairy. Let's go for three. They're safe there. Here we go. They're not on the stack. They're not in your hand. They can't be messed with if they're in your library. Stand by and watch. Got to be careful, though. If you have all three in your deck and your opponent can somehow resolve Unmoored Ego, acquisition for Ego and get them all. So if you have one on the board, you're safe. But. I don't think we're seeing an Unmoored Ego cast with this mana. There is a Thought Erasure now in hand, though, for Nass, and only one Counterspell left for Seth Manfield. Negate. That is kind of interesting, right? Oh, and he, he, he drew... He was holding a blue mana, but he drew another one, so he can actually play this Thought Erasure if he wants to try to get rid of one of the Teferis. Well, we haven't seen Matt Nass's graveyard, but what if he does actually have that combo that you just mentioned. Well, I mean, he can protect getting that thing resolved. He does have two Masterminds acquisitions. Okay, wait a minute now. That that line of play that you described is legit. I just don't think Seth is gonna not have at least one Teferi on the battlefield with, where, so it's protected. Because okay. even if you got the rest egoed, you could always just loop that one. Okay. So he would need to find that plus a way to deal with uh, onboard Planeswalker. Yeah. And so Frasca's Contempt. His lands are being Right, the, the clock is very much on here. Not the clock that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, but the one that uh, Teferi Emblem is putting on Matt Nass as he uh, is losing his lands, often multiple per turn. Only five cards left in the library for Nass as well. Not too far. I'll tell you what, if anybody could find their way out of a mess like this, it would be Matt Nass. He excels at these corner cases, these weird situations you don't always see. These sort of extremes of magic. He's oh. known uh, for playing combo decks. I mean, he definitely has a plan if there is one that exists. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know my responsibility. He knows it might not be likely, but he has something he's, he's, he's hoping for or trying to do. He's not just out there wasting everyone's time. Think in here. That's why he's holding that island. He doesn't want it to get removed. He's holding it for when he needs to cast a spell with it. Keep it in his hand. He can play it and use it in the same turn. Like actions on Seth. Thinking here. Yeah, it looks like he's doing some math. You can see he's kind of mouthing. He's like, oh, okay, if I do this, this, and this, then what happens? What if my opponent finds this? Yeah, he also, um, Matt Nass could get to clear the mind. I mean, it, it, there are no counter spells, right? So if he acquisitions for clear the mind and then says, Island, clear the mind, it's, you know, he's got a full deck again. But even so, once it's a fairy emblem, you shuffle it back in, what's that going to do for you? Right. You're going to lose all your lands. They're getting exiled, so they don't shuffle yeah, back in. that's the problem. He, he, and, and these fairies are still just going to be looping. So if Seth will say, sure, I'll sit here for a while longer if you'd like. Keep up the pace. He's the one with the advantage right now, no doubt about that. 
But Madness has to have some plan in mind here. The question is, does he have enough time left? And what I mean by time is lands yeah, to make that plan happen. I think he's looking for his Mastermind's acquisition. He has set this up. He played Thought Erasure before to take away and negate. Yeah, Seth's turns shouldn't be too complicated at this point because he's just doing the same thing over and over again. You're, you're not casting Mortify, Kaya's Wrath, or Chemister's Insight. So you're really just looping your Teferis every turn. So I'm a little confused as to what's happening here. I think he's deciding how many Teferis he wants in hand and board and in, on top of deck, but once you make that decision, not much is changing. It should there be the it same. There it is. Mastermind's acquisition for Matt Nass. Wow. All right. Now, was this the last turn that he could actually do it? He's going to the sideboard. He has that land drop to give as well. Let's see what happens now. Now, you want to know something really interesting? What's up? If you unmoored Ego, they draw a card for every card in your hand. Oh, you exile with that name, my right? Oh, goodness. You're going to exile these to Look at this. And there's an He's island to hit the battlefield here for Matt Nass. He plays unmoored Ego. Look at Seth. Targeting Seth Manfield. Manfield immediately puts his hand because on his head like, gonna, oh, no. He's going to, because he left one in his hand, that's going to get exiled in the one in his deck. And then he's going to draw a card for each card exiled this way, but he has no deck. Is this the win for Matt Nass? Did he just find the miracle line to get by Seth Manfield here? This is absolutely incredible. I told you. Matt to Nass. Ferry I here. said Matt Nass. He's got the plan. I said he's not giving up. He's not wasting time. He has a plan. And look at this. And he is taking him away. And Unmoored Ego this. forces you to draw a card with no cards left in the library. That is Matt Nass advancing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Getting by Seth Manfield and knocking him out of the tournament. What an incredible comeback for Matt Nass. We knew he had a plan. He finally found it. And he got it done at the very last minute. Matt Nass, the master. Unbelievable finish there from Matt Nass. My mind is blown. I will tell you, though, if there's anybody in the field that could find an obscure line like that and put it into play, it was Matt Nass. He gets by Seth Manfield and knocks Seth out of the tournament. Yeah, that was that was wow. cool to watch. I mean, like I said, Matt Nass is the kind of guy, he, he's a thinking player. He had a reason. If, 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 if there was no way to win, he would have conceded. There was something he was playing to, and I think that's why we saw Seth wondering what to do he was just thinking and i said well he's gonna you gotta figure out what you're gonna do nothing's changed and stick with it and remember i mentioned earlier he could just keep having them in his library but you don't want them in your library you want one on top but if the one's out of your library you're gonna draw you're gonna go to your draw step and not have one so yeah there's nothing he really could have done there other but, than but he needed that, that one not to be in his hand right? no because even so the one in your library gets exiled and you go to your turn and you draw for your draw step and you don't have one what he needed was a negate he needed that negate and you know what matt nass two turns prior took care of that negate he used the, uh, the Thought Erasure there to make sure to clear the way, but he had to do that not knowing what he was going to draw. Matt had to set that up for multiple turns in a row, realizing that his land base was shrinking and shrinking his access to blue mana. He kept that island in his hand that whole time, showing extreme patience and waiting for just the right moment. And boy, I don't think he would have won if he got it a turn later. I mean, the, he was running out of lands he needed to be able to go for seven there, I right? I he might have had one land in his hand, plus he had... He had, he had the one island. I think he had one extra mana available because he had tapped the four for the acquisition. I think he had three lands and then played Okay, but the if island. he loses two of his lands that next turn, it's, it's done. Over. Becca is standing with Matt right now.